Energy is the top performing stock market industry sector and it's been that way throughout the year. Will it last and how can you take advantage of the trend? Plus, how can you flip your stock market losers into tax savings? Stick around for the answer. Paul Biocchi with SSNC Alps Advisors joins us right after this. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Stephanie Stanton. It is great to have you with us. Be sure to subscribe to ETF Guide TV and post your thoughts on our YouTube comment section below. The energy sector has been one of the stock market's brightest areas. Not only is energy the top performing S&P 500 industry, but major changes to the global energy sector are now at work. So how can you tap into some of these major trends? Well, we are very pleased to have with us Paul Bayaki with SSNC Alps Advisors. Paul, it is great to see you again. Welcome back. It's great to be back. Thank you, Stephanie. So the energy sector has been an S&P 500 industry sector leader all year long, as we know, and that has lifted the performance of the Alarian Energy Infrastructure ETF, that ticker ENFR, and the Alarian MLP ETF, AMLP. Now, do you think energy can continue its dominance and are there any other industry sectors that look promising? Part of the reason that energy has done so well here in 2022, and let's not forget that it was the best performing sector in 2021 as well, is that you've got geopolitical dynamics that are generally supportive of prices. Obviously, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine is weighing on energy markets and, and the supply side of the equation. But even more broadly, when you look at other producing nations, OPEC Plus recently announced a supply cut. The United States has had, at the very least, significant underinvestment in energy production as a result of both the policy backdrop and coming out of the COVID crisis. And partly what we've seen from energy companies is capital discipline. They have not been investing as much money in increasing production as we might have seen in prior cycles. In fact, if you look at crude oil production in the United States, it's below where we were at the peak in 2019. And that capital discipline has flowed through to free cash flow generation. So when you think about fundamentally the nature of energy companies, they've been generating free cash flow, returning that free cash flow to shareholders in the form of dividends and in the form of buybacks fueled by that free cash flow generation. But perhaps more importantly, you look at the energy sector in terms of trailing price to earnings, you look at it on a forward PE basis, and it has some of the lowest valuations in the market. So in a market that has rewarded value relative to growth, energy has been the beneficiary of those three dynamics. The fundamental improvements we've seen at the company level, the valuation story, and then the global macroeconomic backdrop. And going forward, there's not a lot of easy fixes for the supply side pressures in energy markets. We've dipped into the strategic petroleum reserve domestically. That certainly has at the very least put short-term downward pressure on crude oil prices. That's not something that is indefinite because there is a finite amount in the strategic petroleum reserve. But more broadly, energy markets are very tight and demand for crude oil and refined products have been very strong coming out of the COVID pandemic, China's lockdowns notwithstanding. And that's not even considering the strong market for natural gas globally, where we see increasing exports of liquefied natural gas from the United States, which of course is another outlet for domestic production of natural gas. And the longer term outlook for natural gas, of course, is a bridge fuel for our transition to electric vehicles. And during this renewable energy transition means that ultimately U.S. production of natural gas will continue apace. And we're seeing increase in production in natural gas domestically. So I think going forward, energy is at a place where valuations are still relative to the market low. Fundamentals are very strong. 
the macro backdrop remains extremely constructive. So you add those three things up, and energy seems to be well positioned into 2023 and beyond. And this isn't just about, say, the next 12 months or 18 months. This is a real big, meaty, secular trend as these companies have a really big role to play in the energy transition. Now, to answer the second part of your question about other sectors that might be attractive to investors, what we've seen so far this year is energy is the best performing sector by a very wide margin, but the defensive sectors, utilities, consumer staples, healthcare, XLV, XLU, those sectors have actually been on a relative basis performing well. And historically, when you get market environments like this with increased volatility, increased uncertainty about the macroeconomic backdrop and economic growth going forward, it is those defensive sectors that historically provide defensive orientation in the market and strong relative performance. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's shift a little bit, talk about small caps versus large caps. The recent performance of small caps versus their larger peers has been pretty impressive. Uh, for small cap investors, there's the Alps O Shares US Small Cap Quality Dividend ETF, and that ticker is OUSM. What's going on with small caps and why should investors pay attention? The reality with small caps is it's inherently a more risky segment of the market. You have more volatility. These are smaller companies than, say, the S&P 500. And as a result, investors need to assess the levels of risk they're comfortable with as it relates to their small cap allocation. But when you look again at the valuation story on small caps, they trade at price to earnings and price to sales ratios that are significantly lower than that of their large cap peers in the S&P 500. So from a valuation perspective going forward, small caps screen at least relative to the market as potentially undervalued. But also one of the things that's been driving this market is the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar has been very strong against a trade-weighted basket or just based on the dollar index. And domestic companies, companies that are more domestically oriented, tend to be in that small cap segment. And so they're less influenced by moves in the U.S. dollar or specifically dollar strength. So when you think about the valuation story with small caps relative to large caps and, of course, that general macroeconomic backdrop, it certainly seems as if we're starting to see a snapback in terms of the relative performance of small caps versus large caps. But I would caution investors that the period we've come out of with historically low interest rates is one in which small cap companies have been allowed to thrive. And if you look at the Russell 2000, for example, many of those companies, upwards of 30%, don't generate any sort of profitability. And many of them do have leverage. So in an environment where interest rates might not be increasing at the same rate that they have over the course of the past six months or so, they're likely to be elevated relative to where they were over the course of the past decade. And so companies without the profitability and cash flow to service their debts could, in theory, be punished by this market. And if you look at ETF assets in small caps, 90% or so of them are invested in your basic cap-weighted small cap strategies. And we believe fervently that by simply screening that universe for things like quality, higher relative return on assets, lower volatility, higher or lower relative volatility, as well as balance sheet strength and dividends, you can simply take that large cap, that small cap universe and reweight it toward higher quality companies with lower volatility. And again, let's not pretend as if small caps aren't a volatile segment of the market. They are relative to their large cap peers. So simply taking a methodology like the one under OUSM, which focuses on quality companies, focuses on quality dividends, focuses on focuses on quality balance sheets doesn't mean that you're going to be insulated from the overall volatility of small caps. But what it does mean is that the small cap exposure that you have is going to be one defined by higher quality names with higher dividend yields, all else equal, and perhaps importantly, a lack of the shortcomings of 
a big piece of that small cap puzzle, which is companies without real profitability and debt levels that might be unsustainable in a higher interest rate environment. Tis the season for tax loss harvesting, and with so many assets from stocks to bonds and publicly traded REITs all down, there's a lot of tax loss harvesting opportunities. How is it done, and what are some of the examples that investors can apply? At a high level, tax loss harvesting is, is pretty straightforward. You're taking a position that's down from where you purchased it. You have unrealized losses and you're realizing those losses. And in so doing, you're quote unquote harvesting losses. And in many cases, you want to maintain at the very least some semblance of or a proxy for the exposure that you originally had. So let's say you have an individual stock that's down so far since you purchased it. You sell that position and replace it with a diversified ETF that gives you exposure to the same sector. For example, if you have a technology company and it's down, you sell that position, take the loss and replace it with a diversified technology exposure, maintaining exposure to the sector that you were invested in and a smaller slice of that individual company, assuming it's in that portfolio. And again, maintaining your market exposure, but taking the the capital loss to offset against some gains that you might have. And ultimately, most people focus on the tax portion of that because ultimately it is about generating taxable losses that you can then use to offset against capital gains. But it's also about portfolio optimization because when you think about single stocks, that's at least at the highest level, idiosyncratic risk. You're, you're exposed to that individual company, that individual company's execution, that individual company's business, and ultimately, that is concentration risk. Whereas in a diversified ETF, you get not only the benefits of diversification, but some of the offsetting dynamics of other companies in that portfolio. Going from an individual stock to a sector is one example of that. But it's also about portfolio optimization, meaning when you think about the likelihood that you're going to pick a stock that outperforms a given sector, last year it was worse than a coin flip in most sectors. And Ultimately, investors aren't necessarily very good at picking individual stocks. Neither are qualified investors. So for that matter, it's also about rationalizing what you're trying to achieve in terms of the exposure that you want and at the same time trying to maximize the tax efficiency of your portfolio. So step one is looking at positions in your portfolio that might be down. Step two is looking for proxies and exposures that can allow you to replace that individual stock position. But perhaps, importantly, it allows you to think about the benefits of diversifying away that idiosyncratic risk while also at the same time harvesting some losses within a portfolio. So people will switch between funds, replacing a value fund with another value fund, replacing one energy fund with another energy fund. I'm not an accountant, and so I'm not advising anyone to deploy any of these strategies, but by and large, ETFs have been a popular vehicle for folks who are looking to tax loss harvest because there are so many choices in the ETF wrapper. And in many cases, a diversified strategy adds a diversification element to those investors who hold concentrated single stock positions in a given sector or in a given segment of the market. Paul, bearing that in mind, you know, in recent years, we've seen Santa Claus rallies towards the end of the year, but with more people maybe trying to take advantage of the tax loss harvesting, do you think that that could sort of put a damper on that? Might we see more selling heading into the end of the year? Perhaps. This is a year which investors probably have more losses than they're used to over the course of the past decade. And so in theory, that could be a dynamic that weighs on markets as people are liquidating positions into year end. But ultimately, this is really at the margins. And historically, we do see a lot of activity in terms of net ETF redemption and creation activity in the fourth and first quarters of the year as a result of the popular nature of tax loss harvesting in the ETF wrapper. But I, I would caution people to not focus too much simply on the tax 
piece of this because it is important and of course nobody wants to pay more taxes than they need to but it is about reevaluating your strategies reevaluating your exposures and aligning them with what your objectives are and as we head into 2023 coming out of a very difficult year that is 2022 it's important that investors maintain exposure to segments of the market even with the challenging tape that we've seen in 2022, largely because inflation is a meaningful erosion of your purchasing power and of your investment capital. When inflation is running at 7 or 8%, as it has been so far in 2022, the reality is, is that you need to overcome that hurdle at the very least to generate positive net returns in your portfolio. So selling a position and staying in cash isn't always the best option for investors. Replacing that position with a proxy exposure or a substitute exposure can allow investors to remain invested and try at the very least to overcome that big hurdle that is inflation. So bearing all of this in mind, then looking ahead to 2023, what are some of the key investing trends that you'll be watching out for? First and foremost, inflation is, is top of mind for investors. And so we, we saw a lighter than expected CPI print a little while back, which was met with really strong market. And we saw more recently a PPI print that also showed signs that inflation might at the very least be peaking. That is something that investors will continue to watch in the remaining weeks to come in 2022 and into 2023. And of course, how that impacts Fed policy. Of course, the Fed has been very aggressive in their rate hike trajectory. And investors are always trying to read the tea leaves of what the Fed says, what the Fed does, and what their policy is expected to be in 2023 looking for, of course, that popular phrase, the Fed pivot. So those two trends, both inflation and Fed policy, are perhaps the most two important dynamics as we head into 2023 and the most widely watched. But more broadly, I think it's about also thinking through your investment exposures and how they relate to some of the big, meaty, secular trends. Because oftentimes you can have a challenge seeing the forest for the trees. And with what's happening in the short term, you can't necessarily let short-term macroeconomic and market dynamics overwhelm your long-term goals. And some of those long-term goals might not be effectively reflected in your investment strategy. For example, energy is a sector we talked about at the top of this conversation. It's the best performing sector so far in 2022. It was the best performing sector last year. And investors thinking about these big, meaty, secular trends would be wise to think about how the energy transition is going to play out who are going to be the beneficiaries of that energy transition. Because when you think about the amount of government dollars that are being directed at the energy transition, at decarbonization, it is perhaps one of the biggest mega trends we've had in the market for quite some time. And it's going to play out over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And investors who are positioning their portfolios to get exposure to all of those dynamics are perhaps going to have more weight to the energy sector than what the market is currently giving to energy, which is just about 5% of the S&P 500 up from 2.5% just a couple years ago. Paul, thank you for your timely insights. Always a great conversation. It's so good to see you. Likewise, always a pleasure. Happy holidays to everyone. Look forward to seeing you next time. And be sure to visit alpsfunds.com to learn more about the ETF lineup at SSNC Alps Advisors. I'm Stephanie Stanton with ETF Guide. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you soon. Music